Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Again, our guest is John Gallagher. He is the founder and CEO of his company. It's called Growing Champions, LLC. He is an executive coach, a mentor, and a consultant. He was with Simpler Consulting for over a decade after being an operations manager and a division president for two different companies. And he's now the host of a podcast called Uncommon Leader. Uh, or is it, John, let me welcome you to the podcast first. How are you? Hey, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity to meet with you. It's, uh, it's great to be with you today. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your audience as we go through this. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for being here. Um, I, I jumped in because this could be my mistake. Is the podcast called The Uncommon Leader? My notes my notes just say Uncommon Leader. It, it's listed as The Uncommon Leader Podcast. A lot of different things to call it and hashtags of what you end up as long as we get everybody to the to the right side by the end of the call. That'd be good. Right. So um, have uh, encourage. I hope listeners will go and search whatever podcast app or directory you're using to listen to us right now. Go search for The Uncommon Leader. Um, and again, it's John Gallagher uh, is as the host, and he's joining us today. Um, I am so we're, we're, we're flipping the uh, the tables or we're on different sides of the table. I don't know why I'm butchering. I think we are different sides of the camera and the table as we go through, because <laughs> you and I had a chance to do this just last week on the Uncommon Leader podcast. I was gracious that you gave your time there as well. So it's pretty cool to sit on the other side. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's good to have another conversation. Um, this one is actually going to be released first. And then uh, the episode where I pe- appear on John's podcast, The Uncommon Leader, that's going to be October 19th, right? That's correct. Yep. And October 19th, we'll release it. Absolutely. All right. So a uh, different conversation. The tables are turned. And uh, today it's a chance to hear more about John's background and experiences. Um, so, so John, I'll ask you, like I ask um, most every guest on here, I mean, what, what's your lean origin story? Like where, did, where and when did you first get exposed to this? No, I like this question. It's something I had thought about as I listened through other your podcasts. And, and it, it feels funny to say it, but it goes back almost 25 years, which doesn't seem quite possible. But I was an industrial engineer or uh, an industrial, I don't know even, even what my title was, continuous improvement engineer or something like that. And we were launching on this thing called Lean. And like many others, I was pretty skeptical as I got started. I was, I was out of college for a few years but had been trained with a manufacturing company that had been in the traditional MRP world and batch and queue. And that's really all that I knew at the time when they started throwing out these terms, it really was interesting. So to have a sensei come in really to our factory for the first time and, and tell us how things needed to change dramatically and go forward. Ad- admittedly, I was a little skeptical, uh, especially when we got friends from our division headquarters that came with them to go along and make this change. But I got to tell you, it was an easy transition for me after that first event and what I observed, I was hooked and there was, there wasn't enough information I could get my hands on, but it was an assembly rapid improvement event. We were trained by Moffitt associates and Bill Moffitt, uh, rest may his, uh, our rest in peace. Now he died too young, uh, as I went through the journey with him, but he was my first teacher in lean and I found him to, bo- to be both challenging and, uh, entertaining to say the least, as it went through from a sensei standpoint. And he was, he was very helpful on my lean journey. And I really try to model some of my behaviors as well as uh, some of the things that I say after Bill today. So that was, again, it, part of it is just challenging that it's been that long since I got started on this journey 25 mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah. And, and well, there's, there's a lot we could sort of dig into there from, from what you said. Um, I'd be curious to hear more of um, your, your thought process of, having a couple years of experience in a traditional system, you know, leading to some skepticism, like for better or for worse. And in some ways it was a challenge for me. I was exposed like very much at the beginning of my career that lean was the right idea. That didn't mean that the organization I worked in practiced it, but I was already biased toward lean. Um, can, can you share a little bit more about that thought process of where you were starting to get biased toward the the quote unquote the way it's always been done yeah i think that's pretty i mean it's a great question and, and as i as i learned a little bit on my lean journey and then i hearken back to the first few years i'm like oh my gosh what could have been possible so i'll, I'll just tell you a story the first mm-hmm. first job i had coming out of college as a, a mechanical engineer i went to a wiper blade manufacturer in indiana and we started out and, and you gotta i mean again when you start to think about this from a lean standpoint uh, it's absolutely excruciating, 
but they had the traditional lineup of punch press departments and a cleaning line and then a sub assembly line and then assembly and packaging. And every time you got one of those steps done, you went and put it back in the warehouse and counted it to make sure you had good control of what parts were there to think about. And my, one of my second jobs was to be the scheduler for the paint line. Now, you got to really have fun and, and start to laugh about this because what I had to do was go to the paint line supervisor and say, okay, here's the stuff that's available to paint today in front of your line. Let's count it, go ahead and paint it, and then we'll put it in the warehouse. And that was about 15 minutes a day of real work. And then I'm like, hmm. is this really what it's supposed to be? So, but again, I guess that influence, that first that first job out, that first opportunity out, not knowing a whole lot of difference in going through with it, I just felt it was like the way that everybody did it. And so that's how I get wired over the first few years, even further along with a, a fuse manufacturer that I went to and how we sub-assembled parts and again, put them away and even very small circuit breakers and fuses where we did this multiple times because that's just how we did it. And it was more about an accounting system than it was about mm -hmm. a customer service system to make things happen. And then when I saw the opportunity to say, why do we do all these things? Why do we make all these counts? Why do we stop and wait and put things into these parts, uh, hotels, uh, as my teacher, Bill Moffa used to call them and just leave it out there and get it done. So it was just more than anything else on the process mapping side of it was to understand the amount of time these you know, parts spent waiting for something to actually happen to them when it really didn't have to happen. It just, it, it clicked so uh, so well and so logical and then as it wired me over 25 years it wasn't just about work anymore it was about you know really became a way of life as well and you saw things whether it's restaurants or service industry industry or whatever that was that had an influence on me but it was something that stuck more than anything else and I was glad I got introduced to it when I did back in 1997. Early enough it seems and it, it, and it you know, one thing I think I've I, I hope I've gotten better at this over time is having empathy for people whose time in the old system isn't measured in years, but in decades. Like oh, that, that's great. That, that leads that's a to great more point. skepticism, right? I mean, how what have you learned about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, individuals that have been in that system like that for so long. Yeah, again, I had one or two years in that system. And I know there are people in those organizations that have been in that for 25 or 30 years. I mean, it's just crazy how that happened. Now, again, your point about empathy, I, I use the the term oftentimes, especially when I'm consulting now, is you know meeting them where they are. Mm -hmm. And as we see different organizations go through different transformations, as sensei, we have to be very aware, or consultants, we have to be very aware of where those individuals and where those organizations are on their journey. They're not going to be the same place that an organization that's been on the lean transformation journey for five or even 10 years is when they first get started. So having the empathy and trying to meet them and, and share your stories. That's a big part of what happens. Let me share stories with you about how others change as you go through that. And it's interesting to think back to what you're describing, you know, with the, uh, the MRP scheduling and the departmental layouts and the batch and queue flow of uh, putting parts into inventory. And then it, it's interesting, like the, the, all of that counting seems like a countermeasure to a problem that shouldn't even exist. In Absolutely. A well, I mean, they're thinking about parts that are walking away. I'm like, I don't know why anybody would want to walk out with parts that are sub assemblies other than, you know, to sell the material. And back in the early 90s, we weren't in the great copper days where things were uh, really expensive to go and sell materials. But it truly was a control and to say, hey, we don't trust the operators to make those decisions. We've got to go in there and count them and weigh them and then put tags in there and, and a piece of paper inside of each bin as to how many that are on there, scan it into a location, and then you know, the old, the infamous annual cycle count that you had to do of mm -hmm. all those things and find out when they really didn't add up anyway, as you went forward and they never could figure out the shrinkage or whatever was happening. I mean, it's just, it's story after story in looking back of, of what could have been inside of that, inside of the industry. So, yeah. Cause I mean, you know, uh, improving flow could mean counting parts as they come off of the end of the cell instead of counting them however many times along the way. Absolutely. Well, again, I remember this, this funny story. So I used to be a second shift supervisor in a, in a fuse assembly location. And 
we would we were making circuit breakers, but we'd do this little sub assembly, and then we'd spend a lot of time stacking them up, and then putting cardboard layers in be, in between each layer of circuit breakers and stacking them up, and trying not to spill them as they move to the next operation, rather than just putting it in a single line, doing one at a time as we went forward. So, I don't know. You know, again, it seems so obvious now compared to what it was then. Yet, as you say, these organizations that have done it the same way for so long, I can understand how it would be difficult to change and and move forward from something like that you've done for so long. Yeah. Uh, quick aside for the healthcare listeners, you know, as uh, John was already saying, and I would uh, I would uh, emphasize, counting items doesn't add value to anybody. And you know, there are still some hospitals operating, I'm sure you've seen this, John, um, operating on par level systems where people from materials management are counting everything every day to figure out how much to restock instead of having a Kanban system that could just Instead of very visual, out. having a Kanban system just to see that as they go forward. Yeah, I mean, healthcare systems in general, you know, inventory is one that isn't treated uh as, as true inventory, if you think about it. I mean, I'll give them, I'll give them a little bit of credit. They're not trying to uh, at least track it in their inventory dollar system to try and understand most of the clients, the healthcare clients that I had worked with before. Mm -hmm. But there is still an opportunity where they, they don't have the visual management of setting those up. Those are some of the most successful mm -hmm. pieces inside of healthcare, whether it's in the clinic or a hospital environment of just setting yeah. a visual management system up in place so that the operators know where their stuff are. And again, we could make up the, the the war stories of what happens inside and how materials get hoarded and hidden in drawers all over the emergency rooms and all over the clinics to make sure that they have it available when they need it. But that's the type of culture that's created when you use these par levels and it's only a purchasing person that's really making responsibility for it. Or the infamous purchasing person gets a, a great buy on six months worth of gauze pads and they got nowhere to put it uh, and ends up in the clinic taking up room space or value added space of what's happening. So those purchasing agents are compensated in a way that makes it convenient. And actually they're recognized for getting those great deals and those, those big buys as well as they bring those forward. So, so many different flaws that we've seen all, all along. And, and that's even in itself, that's a, a great story of, of understanding how healthcare has both been challenged, uh, but, but some have embraced the need for continuous improvement inside that industry. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the hoarding to me, whether it's drawers or pockets or ceilings or wherever, I mean, that, that's, that's, I, 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 you know, I think we're on the same page here. We're, we're not blaming the people for hoarding. Those are people who are not being well supported by the supply chain system. Yep, absolutely. The process is so broken that creates the need to be able to do that because it's so difficult for them to get those things when they need it. And rather than waiting for it to run out to order those types of things there and use a visual system, you know, they end up without it. And it's just, it's just un unfortunate. And again, so you think about that from the employee standpoint, you also think about that from the, the patient standpoint as well. And when, when things are available, when things are needed and, you know, <laughs> I mean, and it, much like the manufacturing story, you know, to experience a healthcare system prior to seeing it behind the, the scenes from a continuous improvement standpoint, it's pretty scary, the two different sides of that story. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll come back and maybe talk about healthcare more in, in a little bit. But I'm, I'm curious, John, to go back to uh, the first Kaizen event, the first Sensei. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Bill Moffat. Like, you know, how, how much detail can you share? What, what do you recall about that first event? It sounds like you know there was an element of uh, we're from headquarters, we're here to help. That's not always well received. But what, what, how much do you remember about that first well, event I, and I, the dynamics there? Yeah, I love some of the Bill Moffat isms. And one of the things he said to us at the end of the day on the on either the second day or the third day from a report out standpoint as he was meeting with us, and I still use this today with clients and those listening who have met me before probably heard me say this, but he says, I'm not here to comfort the afflicted, I'm here to afflict the comforted. And what it really was about was a, was the standpoint of saying, look, you've done things a certain way for so long, and you've been, air quotes, successful at what you've done in that space, you've been profitable. But it's really not about what you've made, it's about what you've left on the table. So that specific, that specific event where I was involved on a team was in lighting assembly. And we were, we were 
assembling an explosion proof lighting fixture that went into the electrical construction uh, materials environment. And again, even as simple as labeling a housing that went through. So you had the large UL label that was on there and we would take 20 housings and we put all the labels on the housings first and then start to pass them down the line. And the simplicity of not batching those up uh, to go down the line versus doing the label one at a time right on the assembly line was pretty powerful. And then the second part of that, I mean, we had fork truck material handlers at the time that brought things in, but to keep the value added person doing value added work and the implementation of whether you call it a water spider or a, a line server or uh, some type of runner to make sure that the parts were available at the point of use when the operator needed them. Those are really two you know, things for me. Single piece flow was the only way to go and not batch, realizing that the quality defect that could happen where you put 20 of them on there and you find out you had the wrong label printed 20 times versus once when you figure it out. And then again, secondly, is to make sure that the value added uh, assemblers, the value added people always had the work directly in front of them to make that work. So some of the creative things we did for parts handling uh, to distribute them right in front of the operator were a lot of fun. Carts, mm -hmm. right size carts. We had a great maintenance department that was so helpful and creative in, in making those types of tools that could feed the parts in was, was really a lot of fun as well. And in that event and then event, other events you were involved in and then leading, you know, the focus was on actually doing things, That's the right. experiments, moving things around. Can, can, can you talk about that versus the trap that you, you may have heard about from others or have seen of, of a Kaizen event becoming this, just this, this planning exercise for things we'll implement in, in the a future. A long-term planning event, absolutely. A rapid mm. planning event. That's, that's, you know, that's funny, even as a consultant now and talking about those stories. But I think that is pretty powerful and to understand the impact of changing something right then. You're exactly right. We weren't necessarily ready for, let's go change it now. When he says something like that, and we're like, we're pausing. We're like, do you mean like right now? He's like, yes, go change it right now and make that work. So it was interesting. It was more of everything else we had been done up until that point was a project as we went forward with it. We planned it out and we wanted it to be perfect. And the, the idea of the experimentation as well was that it was okay for it not to work some of the things that we did. Some things wouldn't work, but the, the part that wasn't acceptable is that we didn't try something. We didn't make some change really happen. And I think, you know, the, the, at least the, there was about 200 folks that worked in our facility at that point in time. And I had the chance as we went through that to become promoted to the facility manager at that location as we went through. So there's, you know, there's a whole leadership component inside of that as well, but to engage the operators in making the changes as well. And it wasn't just a change coming from the engineers or coming from the managers who are saying, okay, we're going to change the way we assemble things today, or we're going to change the way we handle things today. And this is what I'm going to tell you to do. So just do it. But having those operators on the team as well, make that change, I think was a huge culture shift for us as well. Really good, really good culture shift. Yeah. And, and maybe just to dig a little deeper, I mean, I think that's such an important distinction of uh, planning a project where you feel like it's guaranteed success versus trying things out in an experimental way. That's sometimes a huge change in mindset, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, again, whether, whether that's for the engineers or the managers, right, of being afraid to make mistakes because we don't have time to make mistakes. It's one thing to ask the assemblers to do something differently. But as a leadership team, you weren't necessarily told that it was okay to make mistakes and make that happen. You know, the other part, again, there's so many... I mean, it's just a, almost a lean training as you go through it, but the the opportunity to put a long-term project in place like that, put something like that in place, and then have something come back 30 days later, and it's back to exactly the same way you did it before because there's no visual management, there's no hour-by-hour -hour performance, there's no tracking of what the error codes are. Um, you know, while I would say did not ensure failure, but it certainly made it difficult to assess the improvement over a period of time. And so to implement those hour by hour uh, improvement charts with the markers that said you're supposed to make 18 and you made 16, and here's the comments as to what affected me that hour, that's just a different philosophy than the traditional cost accounting method of at the end of the day, count up how many pieces you made at each operation and log them into the computer so we can back flush all the material to go forward with that. I mean, just so many different words, the, the infamous back flush in the manufacturing resource planning and the bill of material to understand where the costs are, 
but the real cost was in how many times you handled it and how many times you put it in and out of the computer system and all those different pieces. Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about Bill Moffat. I, I know the name. I don't know much about him. I, I never didn't have the chance to meet him. First off, what, what was that phrase again? Um, he was he, being there to comfort the afflicted. Yeah, or... he, said, he, said, he said, I am not here to comfort the afflicted. I'm here to afflict the comforted. And, you know, what he really talked about was, you know, you all are too comfortable in your ways. And it's not my job as a consultant to be, quote, Minnesota nice to you <laughs> and tell you what's going on. I'm going to tell you where, where things need to change. and I'm going to push you to a space you wouldn't go. And I need, you know, at, at times, you know, that while he was trained by the Japanese, so he didn't have the same rough, abrasive approach as mm -hmm. the traditional Jap Japanese. And if he said, you know, Shingo Jitsu or whoever was teaching mm -hmm. there and how they would use a, a really, uh, let's say, brass um, or brash uh, approach with leadership. He, he would do that if he had to, but it wasn't like him. And that's what I appreciated about some of his changes, but or some of his approaches uh, in terms of being a good teacher. But he was there, again, to probably push us to a place we would not have gone on our own. And that's what I, I know that to be true for sure. And as experiences, I mean, the first book that I read on lean was Lean Thinking, while written by Jim Womack uh, and, and understood in the great story about wire mold, Bill had worked at wire mold. He had trained in Japanese. So his name was all through that book, his and Bob Pentland. And then so there are about four other consultants that made up Moffat Associates at the time. So they were the second generation Japanese that came in, but they were trained in the Danaher business system, which really was the, if you will, the, the model of the Toyota production system in the U.S. as you went through uh, and made those changes. He was a he was a pretty powerful guy in that space and, and mm -hmm. someone who pushed us really hard. And and so it seems like that combination of meeting people where they are, but pushing them is key. Like meeting where they are doesn't mean let them stay where they are. That, That's right. There, there, there's an art. And I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, with some of your reflections of times when you know, you're trying to figure out how hard should I push? How hard can I push? You want, you want to move them forward without people then, without them disengaging uh, altogether. Like where, where do you find, how do you find that balance? Well, it's a great, that's a great question. And, and not one, I mean, if, if every consultant could figure that out, they'd have, they definitely have more success inside of that space. And so, you know, much like even being a team leader as an employee, as a consultant, you've got to go in, Kim Cheney, another ism, Kim Cheney was another consultant. They worked with me at Simpler, and he was a good friend, and he worked with me in the manufacturing world as well as a VP of manufacturing. But he would talk about real early on, you got to know your chickens. And those chickens would be the ones, and without being rude in terms of understanding, was that know which team members you were really able to uh, have an influence with. Find out which ones were the influencers, because you didn't have to tell the whole team to make a change, but you had to find the one or two on the team that were willing to take a risk and then let the others follow them. It wasn't always comfortable. It wasn't always easy, but it was a matter of finding the right people uh, that would that would trigger that change. And you, you didn't want to do that in finding the, the bosses that were on the uh, teams, but it was the one where the influencers in the shop mm -hmm. who could really help to help you as a consultant be successful and make that work. What, whether we like it, I mean, we used to talk about it simpler, the three R's that really determined our success, reputation, relationships, and results. Uh -huh. And if we weren't building relationships with those clients, it wasn't just about beating them over the head with the Toyota production system or the simpler business system, but it was to tell them we were going with them on that journey and yeah. that we were going to, we were going to help them. And it was a, a team effort. So I wanted to you know, hear about, you know, we look at some of the career steps that you, you know, they're shown in your bio. You talked about being um, a second shift supervisor and then becoming an operations manager and then being a, division president. I mean, what, what are some of the different things you learned from those roles? It sounds like as a division president, then you had broader business responsibility, P&L responsibility beyond operations. Can, can you tell us about some of that progression? Sure. I mean, coming right out of college, I was, I was fortunate enough to work for an organization while well, it's listed as Eaton Corporation now, it was Cooper Industries at the time, going through a manufacturing training program with them that gave me uh, the experience, if you will, in four different facets of manufacturing and at two different locations. So we knew that coming out that we were going to be at least 
two different locations and probably three as we came forward. But we were going to do assignments in uh, quality assurance. We were going to do an assignment in materials. We were going to do assignment in manufacturing engineering, and then an assignment in production supervision. And they didn't have to all happen in that exact order. But those experiences, that well-rounded component of it was pretty uh, valuable as I went through that as an organization, as a result of, you know, really those four, and I didn't have any lean experience going through that, but, you know, the, the learning to lead people, especially on a second shift when there's nobody else in leadership there to go to with questions and things like that. I was the only supervisor on second shift in the uh, facility we had in Chicago was, was great experience, especially from a leadership development standpoint and understanding that it wasn't just about being an engineer that made me smart. It was about leadership and working with others that helped to carry that forward. I got to say that the the evolution of the the roles, whether they went from uh, facility engineer to facility manager or site manager to VP of operations and manufacturing, and subsequently the division president in Fort Wayne, Indiana, was more about the ability to get things done through others, to understand that you had to put a great team in place and develop the team that that needed to be there. You had to have a structure to go through it as well. I mean, in in the end of the time I had in Roanoke, Virginia with Cooper Industries or Eaton, it really was about us being early on the journey and implementing lean. And by by doing that and by having some success, I was able to, in essence, get recruited to the next opportunity uh, because I think that community ultimately, back then especially in, in the early 2000s, was a small community in terms of successful lean transformation that was happening. And so they were recruiting and making sure that, you know, they were putting the right leaders in place to make good things happen. So, but I think more than anything else, it's about the leadership characteristics of integrity and, and valuing other people and you know, the consistency of approach that worked and got, got me those opportunities. When I left uh, the division president role in 2006, it was at my choice. I, I made the choice to move back to Roanoke, Virginia for family purposes and actually got started in real estate and decided to take some of the lean learnings that I mm. had in manufacturing and see if I could handle that in, in real estate sales, residential real estate sales. And I teamed up with my mother-in-law to uh, form a real estate team. And within 18 months, we were the number one performing team in, in the Roanoke Valley, which was good. And it was about setting up standard work for how to handle listings and about setting up standard work for handling closings and still mm. focusing on that relationship side of what was happening there. Now, my mother-in-law had, you know, had, had a good base of, of work that had been done, but the opportunity to put new systems in place to make improvement felt like it worked in real estate sales as well. So, <laughs> wow. And then, I mean, the whole story getting back into uh, healthcare was, was a lot of fun, if you don't mind me sharing that just a little bit. I mean, I rode the real estate market all the way to the bottom in 2008, 2009, and it wow. got to where that business wasn't a whole lot of fun anymore as I went through that. And so I was assessing whether or not I wanted to get back into manufacturing and operations. And I got a call from previous uh, co-workers who said, hey, why don't you go work for this simpler consulting company, do lean consulting. I said, look, I got, I got no desire to be a consultant. I really don't. I don't, I don't have any interest in that travel life that, that needs to be done. And it's just not something. And they called me back two times. And the third time they called me back and said, look, we know you said don't do that. But what if you did it in healthcare, the lean in healthcare? And I hadn't really heard of that or associated that before. I said, that sounds kind of interesting and, and another good experience. And as I wrote a note to myself, I said, maybe I'm naive enough to believe that I could actually make a difference inside of that space and working with some of the individuals in that area. So I said, okay, I'll try that for a couple of years and then get back into operations at some other point. It was a good, good experience, I thought, to get in. And that was 11 years ago. And I've been doing it kind of ever since, if you will, inside of healthcare. A, the time goes by so fast. Mm -hmm. But secondly, is I really found that I, I was interested in it, especially on the healthcare side. And I found to be pretty good at it in terms of the relationships that I build, especially with the C-suite and some of the leaders in these organizations and helping to make a difference. So I've hung around in it. It's just something that's worked out pretty well. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, this is a topic that's come up with uh, a number of guests. You know, you come into healthcare from a different industry, manufacturing, and um, interesting to have some time in a different service sector in, uh, in real estate. Um, probably hit with the phrase or the question or the statement, uh, sometimes in a challenging way, you know, but John, patients aren't cars. How often do you get hit with that? What's your approach for addressing 
that concern or that question? Well, it certainly was early on. Uh, I, in fact, I remember my first event or rapid improvement event in healthcare was on the implementation of the diabetes protocol in a clinic where if a patient had di- if a patient had diabetes, they were supposed to come in every four weeks or every 12 weeks on an A1C based on how often, and they had a percentage that they weren't achieving on that protocol and they were looking to make improvements to their processes there. And I'm thinking to myself my first weekend, are you kidding me? How can we not be doing this in healthcare if we have a diabetes patient, we're not following up with them and getting them in there when they need to be there. And my guess is I probably heard that that week about, oh, John, we don't make cars here. We treat people and their people are different. I'm like, you're absolutely right that people are different than cars. But I, but I would come back with a however in it, you know, uh-huh. that there are, there are processes within every patient's visit, including the diabetes protocol, that if we just followed the standard for those types of activities, it would allow you as a physician and as a care team to take care of the patient the way you're supposed to do in a different way. And that's the empathetic side of healthcare that's not easy to quote standardize. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other the other term that I would hear getting into healthcare is well, you're trying to get me to practice cookbook medicine. Mm-hmm. And that's that's just not true. But I am trying to get you to practice a standard for the things that could be standard. Each one of your practices should be rooming a patient or a hospital, emergency room with the same way each time. I mean you've got to check vitals. You've got to put those vitals in the computer system. You've got to check their weight. You got to check their height. You got to ask them what they had to eat in the last 24 hours and make those things work. Ask the same questions every time for every patient so that when the physician gets in the room, they don't have to ask those questions. I mean, just different Mm -hmm. stories like that, but it was about, you know, again, understanding that when they said patients weren't cars, Mm -hmm. I absolutely agreed with them, but that there were processes that that patient experienced that they could standardize and reduce the variation uh, in terms of some of those activities. So Mm -hmm. just, you know, I would, and frankly, uh, I would actually end up being patients in many of the clients that I had. I said, if I'm going to be here, I'm going to go ahead and experience their system. I wouldn't tell them. I'd just sign up to be a patient, and I'd start to go through their system. And then I'd share my experiences with them, what I, what I actually experienced. I did it with a client when I went through my neck surgery. Uh, I had I had a neck fusion surgery back in 2015, and I was, I was a consultant with a, a, a large hospital system and didn't tell them I was going through the system to get my – didn't tell the leadership team that I was doing that. And I documented my story all the way through about the six months that it took me to get through that and then told them in a transformation review what I experienced. So that was pretty powerful to the point that the chief medical officer stood up and you know, was in tears about what I had experienced. And I said, look, the care that I experienced was magnificent. And that's generally what happens. But it's the right. process that the patient experiences with regards to the other things, billing, setting up appointments, all those different activities that really shouldn't be bad that make the whole experience of healthcare uh, really terrible in most yeah. cases. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, like, like you're saying, it's, uh, it's great people, it's caring people uh, burdened, in, uh, burdened with um, dysfunctional systems or systems that don't support them. Um, it's funny, you know, you think of, so I, you, back to a couple of minutes ago, you're saying, uh, yes, uh, it's a factual statement. When somebody hits you with patients are not cars, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, agreed. Okay, now what? Like, what mm-hmm. the, the right. however or Let's the- Let's set that aside the, now. The, the, the what now. And, um, you know, as long as, you know, people are inquisitive and trying to learn, okay, well, tell me about what other hospitals have done as opposed to just shutting mm-hmm. down. Um, cookbook medicine is interesting because I've, I've taken enough cooking classes to think of, well, you know, there, there can be a standard recipe but they also teach you taste what you're cooking because there's inevitably variation in ingredients and um, you could be following the quote unquote cookbook. That, that's unfair to chefs. Like a good chef is going to vary the way they're cooking. So there's this question right. I want to throw back to you of it's not binary, standard or not standard. Like there, there's, there's this middle ground. I'm curious if you have thoughts of working with people, of figuring out, what to standardize and to what degree it can be standardized? That's it's a good question. And one, one of the things I used to, to say as you know, follow-ups as we went through the journey, I said that every patient should get unique care delivered in a standard way. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, ultimately it was absolute that every patient is different because, you know, I mean, let's, let's just talk the science of it. Again, you almost have to set that aside. Genetics, people are different. Um, you know, the, the type of care that they received as a child, the things that existed already, co, co, coexisting conditions or excuse me, pre-existing conditions mm-hmm. that were there that have an impact on the care. So every patient does need to be dealt with differently in a standard way as you ask some of those questions. So, you know, my, my question always really was, is what, what are the questions that every patient must hear from you that you need a response from every patient uh, to move forward? Some of the challenges, look, I mean, not to, not to dive down a, a different rabbit hole here, but I was thinking about this beforehand in terms of some of the challenges in healthcare is that that, that 15 minute encounter is, you know, such a small amount of time, talking about that patient visit, or even that experience in the hospital with it's two or three days, is such a small amount of time in the care of a patient over the course of their life. So it's these other external circumstances and understanding with empathy, learning what the challenges are that they face outside of the office and making things happen where you can make those good things happen. So again, if I know going in that my patient has had their A1C checked, that they have had, they're, they're over 50 years old and they've already had, and it's marked in the system, they've already had their colonoscopy and that they are uh, already on their blood pressure medicine and they've been taking it properly, and but they haven't been able to take their statins or whatever they are, okay? And I can see that in a mock-up so that the physician can now focus their energy in a unique way to say, tell me what's happening in your life now that's impacting you because I've already got all the standard data. I know how much you weigh, I know your blood pressure, you know, I know your pulse, pulse ox and all those things. So those are the standardized things I should always have available to me as a physician so that I can be the empathetic uh, physician that I need to have. I'm, I'm losing the, the gentleman from the Jefferson University he used to talk about that. He was, a, he was an OBGYN and he talked about what I really want to be able to do is focus on the personal side of being the physician and not on the detail side of what should have already happened before it got to me. So you know, the physician needs to be able to recognize that his team can do good things. And that's, that's part of the challenge as well, that, I mean, those physicians have been trained to do all this stuff on their own for all those years in their training. And they get out and they get, they're asked to perform in a team environment uh, that others can do things for them. And they're not used to that. They're not trained for that. They don't understand that. So there's a, there's a culture change for them personally in a, in a personal transformation they must go through as well. I mean, a physician, you know, growing up likely as a straight A student, Mm-hmm. going through all the way through med school, they've always been told they're at the top of their class, whether it's through high school and then you know, their four-year degree. So they've never been told they have to change. They've always been told how great they are. Mm-hmm. Now, it's an opportunity for us to empathize with them, meet them where they are and say, yeah, and there's a better way that you can yeah. do it now as well. So, well, I love that phrase, just to go back and recap, as you put it, unique care delivered in a standardized way. Mm-hmm. That sounds... Um, like an impossible challenge, but we, it, it is, it is possible. Yeah, I think it is possible. And I think, you know, you look at the, the, you know, the, the value stream that is the patient who starts uh, at birth and goes through till they either leave your healthcare system or they expire. That, well, that means mm-hmm. they die or they move somewhere and go somewhere else, that there are standard touches that should always exist for a patient, regardless of the circumstance. And how are we as a healthcare system, how are we, as an ecosystem, making sure that all those touches occur because they don't have to always happen inside the physician's office. They don't, I mean, that's a whole different conversation we could spend a lot of time on with regards to where care is provided, but there's, there's a certain set of um, protocols that every person has to go through to, to determine future success in terms of their health. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to pivot and, um, talk about your podcast. Um, and again, our guest is John Gallagher. His podcast is called The Uncommon Leader. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear what was the inspiration for starting the podcast and why a podcast with this really interesting theme? Sure. Thanks for that question. I think it's something that's been uh, brewing uh, for a long time in me. I mean, I've thought of for a long time about really the opportunity of running my own business, both coaching and consulting in a little different way, especially from a leadership development standpoint, which is something I've had a passion for really since my first mentor introduced um, the first leadership book to me, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell back in 1998. 
And I much like in 1997, when I became hooked on lean, that book and that leader hooked me on leadership development as well and the important side of leadership development. And so, you know, the, the definition, the uncommon leader really got started with, you know, a good leader can help an organization to, to grow. A good coach can help a team to win a few games, but a great leader or an uncommon leader, an uncommon coach is one that not only helps them to win, but also makes a difference in their life as well. So it's success in both work and in life from a vocation standpoint. The, the word uncommon really came from a, a daily devotional book that I read, uh, Tony Dungy, and he wrote the, the un, I think it was the, un, yeah, the Uncommon Life this daily is, uh, devotional the, as I look at the book. This is the football coach, Tony football Dungy. Coach, Tony he's, Dungy. He's got, yeah. Read it on okay. a daily basis still, absolutely. In terms of the Uncommon Life. Uncommon Life. And that's the daily, that's a daily reading from Tony Dungy. And he talked about he had a football coach in his life that really, you know, defined uncommon as doing the an ordinary thing in an uncommon way, such that again, that the results were everlasting, that they were legacy type. And so the Uncommon Leader podcast was really born out of who are the leaders that I know that are uncommon, that have taken really what their skills are in terms of uh, business or in terms of ministry or in terms of sports or whatever that is, and really done things in an uncommon way, gotten uncommon results with what they've done. And, and one of the things we've talked about is that their, you know, their approach is such that they've not had to run over people, but they've influenced people to get things done. I mean, Mark, you know this in, in your career, as I've, as I've watched your career, your primary role is that of an influencer. You know, you, you're asking people on a regular basis to change mm -hmm. in whatever space that is, whether that's through your blogs or, or your uh, podcasts or your consulting side of the business as well. And they can tell you no. I mean, because they, they, you know, they, they're still, they should pay you for it. Absolutely. But they can absolutely ignore you. So you've got to be an influencer in their life. that's making a difference to say, I need to listen to this person and really understand what they have to say. So I like to interview leaders on the Uncommon Leader podcast that really have made a difference in my life, have been ones that I've seen. And, you know, I have this list of kind of those ones that I've come in touch with uh, that I want to talk to on side of that podcast and ones I've never met before who have still had an influence on my life as well, that mm -hmm. whether it's through their, their writing or their uh, blogging or, or their uh, work that they've done as well in terms of that influence. And that's how, that's how it was born. So it's been pretty cool so far. I've had a good time with it. Well, good. Um, who, who are some of the guests that you've had on and, and how many episodes? Have, I don't know that number. We're, right we're just, it's, it's pretty new coming in yeah. in terms of the episodes. We're right at about a dozen episodes total that have come in. I've had, uh, Dr. Paul Deshaun, who is the former CEO of Sutter Gould mm -hmm. Medical Foundation, the author of Preventive Physician Burnout. One of my mentors, Tom mm -hmm. Carmazzi, who is the retired CEO of the, the Tuthill Corporation. Got one coming out tomorrow, though, by my, my trainer, Margot Bellinger, who was my um, fitness trainer for two years and helped me on my personal fitness and health transformation from 260 pounds down to 185 pounds that I've been at now for a couple of years and made a huge mm -hmm. difference in my life from that standpoint as well. I've had my pastor, who's been my spiritual mentor as well, as I've gone through the journey and how he has in, influenced me and, and really talked about others there. And I've had other executive coaches like yourself. I've had Coach Bill Hart from the coaching company that I received coaching from for about seven years on the executive coaching side. So some really some really interesting folks that have, that have been on and, and looking forward to uh, pulling me, more people into that conversation as well. Yeah, and uh, Paul Deshant, he uh, was a guest on this podcast, going back mm -hmm. episodes 230 and 270, talking okay. about the challenge of burnout. And um, so I'd encourage people to go back and uh, listen to those episodes as well. It's funny that you mentioned interviewing uh, your trainer. My trainer, who I had been using in San Antonio, and I would still be using if uh, we were still living in San Antonio, uh, Lenny Walls, he was one of my guests on uh, my newer podcast series, My Favorite Mistake. You know, he's okay. a, retired. He played in the uh, NFL and the Canadian Football League for a number of years. And um, so having him as a guest talking about mistakes as, as an athlete and then as an entrepreneur, um, really interesting. And you know, I wrote a blog post. I was thinking of the connections of um, seeing him operate as a coach. And thinking of parallels of uh, how is that similar to me working with people 
not from a physical fitness standpoint? And then what are some things that I could learn from him? Because I think, well, he, he was certainly having to meet me where I was, but he also pushed mm-hmm. me, thinking Absolutely, back to things right? you said earlier. No, I think about that, and it's a story uh, that goes back. I was having a meeting with several of the, the simpler uh, internal sensei we were in. There's about six of us, six or seven of us in a room. And one of the uh, guys asked me, he said, you know, John, you, you've been working with a trainer and things are going pretty good. Are you going to keep working with the trainer? I said, um, and I, I said his name, I said, look, we are consultants in the continuous improvement space. Don't we continue to encourage our clients to stay with us on the continuous improvement journey as well? So the parallels are amazing. In terms of the business model that is Growing Champions, it's really about the whole person approach to transformation on the coaching side, success coaching, if we want to go at that. And I I refer to it as the seven Fs. And just one of them, my the future that I talk about, and there's a story within that, uh, is your career. But the other side of finances and faith and fitness, fun, friendships, you know, those are ones that you need coaches on as well, whether they're paid coaches or whether they're mentors in some way, shape, or form, you better find one in each area if you want to get better in each area of your life. And it does take that coach, again, back to that definition of an uncommon coach, is one who will take you to a place you never would have gone on your own. And you, you see that. I mean, you may not, if you have not been working with that trainer in San Antonio, much like me working with Margo in Roanoke, Virginia, I still stay in touch with her, although I don't live in, in Roanoke anymore over the past 18 months. But you know, I can still hear her in some of my personal workouts in my ear, pushing me just one more, one more time. And uh, yeah. some of those, you have to listen to that podcast. If you get a chance, yeah. Mark, and really talk about how she used to torture me pretty well. That's for sure. <laughs> but, for, but for a purpose, kind of like your Absolutely. Original yeah. sensei or some of the, uh, the other folks that um, you talk about that traditional style, just go back for a minute. You know, there's this term that would be applied to some of these Japanese sensei, uh, or they would even apply it to themselves insultant as opposed mm, to ins- absolutely consultant. But, you know, I think of, of Lenny pushing me, there was this balance where, I mean, he couldn't make it a competition of like, you know, cause he would work out with me. So he's not just telling me what to do. He's working out, he's demonstrating what good looked like both in terms of form. And like, I don't think I will ever be as fit as Lenny, but it wasn't a point of like him shaming me or making me feel bad. Right. <laughs> or look, exactly. what, look, look what I can do. Why don't you do that? No, that's the other side. That's right. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't an ego. It wasn't coming from no. ego. No. There was definitely purpose inside of that, that again, those individuals know, and that's the uncommon side that those individuals, when you work with someone like that, you know, they have your best interest at heart and it's not just about them. It's about you more than it is about them. Absolutely. Well, and it's also making me reflect when, when, when I caught myself and said, well, I could never be in such good shape as him. That's probably an untrue statement. So I will retract that um, to take a little bit more ownership of it. I choose not to put in the effort in terms of exercise and diet. That's probably a more honest statement. Um, this is a, a real detour, but I, I blogged about this once. Did you ever see the movie? It was a comedy called Central Intelligence with uh, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, yes. mm-hmm. Kevin Hart. Yes. And there, there's there's a scene in the movie um, where, where somebody asks The Rock, like, hey, how, how do you get to be so fit? And I'm paraphrasing. And he's like, oh, it's easy. Just spend six hours in the gym every day for 20 years. Or right. you know, anybody, anybody could do it. I'm like, well, maybe. <laughs> but when you think of like the dedication, bringing it back to the art and the craft of lean work and continuous improvement work. I mean, there's something to be said for like adopting this sort of lifestyle change and being dedicated to it as opposed to looking for the quick fix. Well, I think that's the difference in doing and being right. Regardless of, of where you are in your improvement journey, whether it's a lean transformation, whether it's a personal health transformation, or whether it's again, in a different area of your life, there's, there's doing, there's checking boxes, there's, you know, saying I did those things, but then there's being, it becomes part of who you are. And so you become, and you, you talked about a little bit, like you say things to yourself, like I am a healthy person. I am a fit person. That's a different mindset than saying, I don't know if I can be a healthy person. I don't know if I have what it takes to be a fit person and go forward with that. So your recognition of that and mindset is, is really big. I could be like Lenny, but I choose to be who I want to be, who I need to be 
to be healthy. Adam Ordnine, I know you know Adam as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've interviewed him before hey, on your podcast, he, but he, he has been a guest here. He's yeah. a he's a good friend. And he was a big influence on me on the fitness side and in the the lean space with his innov innovation expertise. But you know, he used to be one to say, "Look, just just start with something small." And you know, we ended up he and I ended up using a hashtag even in teaching called "Stop Eating French Fries." Like, what's the what's one thing that's getting in your way now that you can stop small rather than trying to go all in too fast because you go too fast and it, and it really becomes at, at best, it becomes difficult to make that a lifestyle change and become who you are. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, that makes me think of, you know, kind of the incremental improvement strategy. Um, I, I, I had a friend who was uh, in his travels to Japan. He uh, had studied there and, and his wife is Japanese and he spent a lot of time there. But his parents came from Minnesota and they, like his mother, I think it was, didn't want to eat sushi. And so the, the sushi, sushi chef, that's hard to say. Mm -hmm. right. uh, the sushi chef started her off with like, here is basically some fully cooked fish. Here, try this. And then you can move up to like fish that's been seared, but it is a little bit more raw in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then, then moving to fish that's been seared just a little bit. And then before you know it, you're comfortable with raw fish. And that seemed like a very practical, reasonable strategy of not expecting somebody to make this wholesale change, whether it's in workplace uh, settings or, or their life. Well, I think you're exactly right. And then it goes back way back to one of your first questions about, you know, when you have the resistance to change mm -hmm. at the start, you know, whether it was my, me when I was just getting kicked off on the, the journey in 1997 with lean or whether it was me talking with Adam uh, in my space about 10 years ago and saying, look, the only time I'm ever going to run a mile is if somebody's chasing me down the road <laughs> that I just didn't feel like I had that in me with regards mm -hmm. to being a fit person. And so, you know, the, the start of something small, like just, you know, stop eating French fries in terms of mm -hmm. losing weight was, was a big transformation and allowed you to your point, the continuous improvement of getting there. I think it's one of those ones that you, you talk about movies and I like to use movies as well. And I think one of the, the perfect sensei analogies outside of karate kid, which was a really good right. sensei analogy. And he was Mr. Miyagi was, but mm -hmm. was uh, nanny McPhee and how she would, she told the kids that ultimately when you when you need me, but don't want me, then I must stay as your coach. When you want me, but don't need me, that's when it's time for me to go. And that's, the, that's when somebody's become, you know, the, the person they need to be and is able to continuously improve on your own. And as a sensei, that's when you're starting to win, when the knowledge transfer is recognized such that in, in individual or institution make that change that they don't have to have you there all the time to continuously improve on that journey, to push them all the time to tell them what to do or individually what to eat or what behaviors to do as a leader. I need to get up every day and, you know, read 15 minutes as a daily discipline. I need to, you know, walk the gemba on a daily basis to see what's happening and checking with what's going on. That just becomes part of who you are. And that's when you're winning as a sensei or as a teacher in that space. So again, our guest has been um, John Gallagher. Um, please do go check out uh, his podcast, The Uncommon Leader. Um, I'm going to be uh, a guest on October 19th. And um, I think we are, we're going to do an episode of My Favorite Mistake together. I think we are, yes. Can't wait for that one. I got all kinds of mistakes. So I'll have to choose what my favorite one is, that's for sure. So John's still thinking about that. That's the biggest homework for that podcast is deciding which one. Okay. Is, uh, many, many guests. I've got a big one in mind to go through. So it's family related, but I know it's going to be a good one. Okay. So I'll look forward to hearing that story. And uh, John's company is Growing Champions LLC. Um, who, who, you know, what's the profile of uh, the individuals or organizations that you work with now in that executive coaching and, and mentoring? Sure. Well, I mean, the, the individual leader that I'm targeting, you know, it's interesting, kind of told the story of, of me coming up where that went from industrial engineer to facility manager, facility manager to VP of manufacturing. And the, the ideal client for me, whether it's, you know, industry agnostic in terms of how I go through that, but is that person looking to make that jump to the next level, if you will, whether they're going from engineer to manager, from manager to executive, you know, frankly, from executive to considering retirement and understanding what that means for them in the future as well, you know, becomes an ideal individual client for me on a one-on-one -on -one success coaching level. It's a whole person approach that I work forward with. Mm -hmm. From a consulting standpoint, 
you know, me as an individual right now, I'm contracting uh, with others, but I would, you know, there's, there's organizations that could be uh, up to uh, $250 million in revenue that they go through multi-site that gives an opportunity and they recognize the need to change, but they're small enough that, that me as an individual uh, can have an impact on the overall leadership of the organization. So I like to set it up where I not only coach the uh, or consult the organization on a continuous improvement journey, but also to coach the top executives one-on-one -on, -one on what they're doing from a leadership development standpoint and what's necessary as well on that journey too. So mm -hmm. that's who I'm targeting anyway. First year in, it's going pretty well, staying busy. So, Well, good. And the website where people can learn more about that is? Sure. It's growingchampions.net is the website for more about uh, both the consulting and coaching side. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, a link to the podcast, a link to some of the uh, blog posts and things. Um, John, John's brought up a lot of concepts that for some reason today was just jogging my memory of, uh, of other things from the podcast or um, the blog. One, one other random question for you, John, for those who are just listening and not watching on YouTube, don't see what I do. There is a football over mm -hmm. your right shoulder. So I'm just curious to ask what's there the is. meaning of so the football. The, the, the meaning of that football is actually pretty powerful. So it is the state championship football from my junior year in high school. Now, oh. I didn't get that as a result of being the MVP or anything like that. I actually didn't even play in the game. Mm -hmm. But as a relationship that my dad had, that football was in the state capital, West Virginia, for a long time. And that, that football was with the uh, executive director of the American Legion for the state of West Virginia. And my dad was a, a local commander growing up. And when that gentleman passed away, his son gave my dad that football who gave it to me. But that's got all the signatures of the players from the 1985 state championship football huh. team of Brook High School. And we beat Parkersburg seven to nothing. First state championship in high school history. Wow. Well, I'm glad I asked. That's, uh, that's a very cool connection. What, what position did you play if you would have played? In that game, uh, if I would have been in the game, so I was a good JV player at tight end and defensive end. I was uh, I was not quite fast enough to be, uh, <laughs> but I, I played basketball as well. So with my senior year, we won the state championship in basketball. That's the other, that's the little statue that guy there. Ah, oh, okay. Shooting a free throw. I guess that was kind of fun. And we were yeah. the state champions my senior year in basketball as well, which was kind of fun. And the, you know, my claim, I guess, that I have is I was the first student to graduate from Brook High School with both a state championship in football and a state championship in basketball. So that was kind of cool. They got that going cool. for me. Doesn't make me any money today, but gets me a couple people on Facebook that'll follow me anyway. <laughs> well, you've got a lot going for you, John. So yeah. thank you for sharing um, your experiences and, and some recollections and talking about the things that you're doing and working on today. So um, anyway, I, we could have done a couple different episodes. I mean, we could have done one that dug into nothing but the lean and real estate angle. Um, we could probably do a whole episode on healthcare. So maybe we can do another one someday. We'll do, That'd be we'll, great. do a my, we'll do a my favorite mistake first. Though. Okay. So. All right. Sounds good, Mark. Hey, I appreciate All the right. opportunity again, your gift to the folks that are listening to you. So I know, and uh, the bringing these folks on and having me on there with some of the other names you've there, I do appreciate that opportunity. So hopefully it adds value to you as well. I, I think so. I enjoyed it. So I hope, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I trust the same was true for the listeners. So thanks for the conversation today. I really appreciate it. You're John. welcome, Mark. Thank you. Yeah.